Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. Today, we have with us Dave Drummond on the show. Dave is the Vice President of Sales and Marketing of Georgetown Trust, a one-stop financial service boutique that helps individuals internationalize and find offshore opportunities. He also operates a website called Best Places in the World to Retire, and we're delighted to have him here today as our guest, Good day, Dave, and welcome to SBTV. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Patrick. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all. Thank you. We appreciate you making time to, to speak with us today. IRA is a pretty interesting topic, uh, being that most of us do have 401ks. But when it comes to this, uh, what exactly is a self-directed IRA? Sure, Patrick. So um, a lot of people um, are familiar with, with IRAs in general. Um, when we talk about self-directed IRAs, um, some people think that uh, when they have a self-directed IRA, it's, it's as simple as being able to trade stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. So, you know, a lot of people go to TD Ameritrade and they'll, they'll, they'll have their account and it's connected to their Roth IRA or the regular IRA and, and they're making trades. And they feel like, you know, that's what we talk about when we talk about a self-directed IRA. But it's actually a little bit more than that. Um, when they created the laws for IRAs, you know, there was nothing that said you couldn't invest in alternative types of investments, rental properties, uh, oil wells, um, even precious metals. All of those things are available to you. They're just typically not offered through a standard custodian. So self-directed IRA custodians, um, they allow people to take control of their IRAs in a way that's completely different and invest in those non-standard alternative things. Know, such as real estate, et cetera. So that's really what it is. It's finding a custodian that allows you to invest in um, non, I would say non-standard financial instruments. Okay, uh, you mentioned the word custodian. Uh, can you let us know the difference between what's a custodian and what's an administrator? Sure, so um, IRAs, uh, when, when, the, when the government set up the laws for how IRAs or money is managed, that, that money can never be in your hands. It always has to be in a third party's hands. And so when you talk about IRA custodians, they can be big like Fidelity Investments, TD Ameritrade, Schwab. They can, they can also be smaller individual groups, uh, uh, New View IRA, Midland IRA. So when we're talking about a custodian, they're the ones who are responsible for making sure that the money you put in your account came from you, um, reporting to the federal government on your holdings, making sure those holdings are the correct types of holdings. As we said, there are things that you can hold in them and there are things that you can't. So the custodian is responsible for that. Um, there are situations where the individual can actually be a custodian, um, self 401ks, solo 401ks, um, and even you know SPP, simple employee plans. You know those are different because some of those have the custodian being the you know there, but, but some some of them you act as the administrator. So, but in certain situations, an individual could have um, themselves as the you know have a custodian, and then they could administer it in this in the, in the situation of a solo case, something like that. Okay. Um, what do you say would be the probably the biggest difference between a, a traditional uh, IRA? like a 401k and a self-directed IRA? Sure, that's a good question, Patrick. And, and let me take a step back because you'll hear a lot of people talk about IRA, Roth IRA, uh, 401k, 453. All of those are types of qualified retirement plans. So when we talk about types of qualified retirement plans, um, there, are, there are a myriad of, of, of names and labels that are given to them. Um, and a lot of times in the, in the marketplace where we talk about, you hear self-directed IRA, so only, everyone only thinks about IRAs. But the real difference, um, the nomenclature between an, an IRA, um, we're really talking about um, IRAs that are either, um, they, they can't be active, 401ks that can't be, be active. So they're typically either individual IRAs or maybe you were working for a company and you had a 401k and you left that company and now you have to roll it over to a new custodian. So those are... You know, those are what we're calling. So when you hear us talk about self-directed IRAs, those funds could come from 401ks, 453s, um, IRAs, things like that. And they're moving into a, a new custodian. So when we talk about it, we're really we're talking not necessarily about the container, whether it's a Roth IRA or so, um, an I, a traditional IRA or a 
401k. We're not talking about the container as much as we're talking about the custodian and what the custodian will allow. So the big advantage of a true self-directed IRA is the options that are available to you to invest in expand outside of the traditional uh, standard instruments like stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs. So that's the biggest difference is really the types of investments and the control over your investment choices. That's the major difference between an IRA and a self-directed IRA. Whether it's Roth, traditional, or other, all those rules still hold. Okay. On the uh, on the um, Georgetown Trust blog, it, it says that you work with individuals who plan to go international. Uh, can you explain what going international is all about and why people should start thinking about this? Sure. So when, when we talk about going international, that, that's a great point because I get that all of the time when I present um, what does going international mean? And, and honestly, it means different things to different people. Um, I work with people who simply want to retire outside the United States that, you know, or outside of their home jurisdiction, you know, it's to be kind of U.S. centric. But now across the world, people are looking, where can I, where can I go that maybe has, you know, less people, my money might go further. Um, I have a more lifestyle. Um, I can get away from things. So it's it's from living, simply just living or retiring abroad, spending weeks abroad, to actually I want to set up in another country. I want to work outside of my home jurisdiction, and I want to you know reside somewhere. So what are all those components? So when we talk about going international, they can consist of things like setting up asset protection structures outside of their home jurisdiction, whether it's someone from the UK who may want to protect something or keep something out of the sight of you know, potential litigation or someone who is in Australia may want to work, um, you know, to mitigate their taxes in Australia by working abroad. So they may want to ask protection structure or some vehicle that allows them to do that. It typically has some component of residency associated with it. So maybe I want a second residency, a second passport. Um, a lot of times it will have a banking aspect to it. Um, I want to distribute my funds, you know, from across banking jurisdictions. Um, and then finally, it will be some type of alternative investment. Um, people are usually tipping to look maybe buy a second piece of real estate, maybe buy some agricultural products, um, maybe look to hold some gold or some precious metals outside of, the, uh, of their home jurisdiction. I apologize if you hear me say U.S. more frequently, but a, a lot of my I tend to be from the States, but, but, but they're all over from all over the world. So, you know, those are the things about going international. It's about how can I take advantage of the um, the laws allowed by my my home jurisdiction and the foreign jurisdiction to maximize my lifestyle, my income, and and my overall um, um, ability to to be free, basically. So let's say if uh, someone plans to go international, and we're talking about them looking for countries that would benefit them in in one way or another, uh, which countries would uh, be considered favorable jurisdictions for someone starting to go international? That, that's a that's a really good question. It's a really tough question at the same time because, uh, you know, go. I don't s tend to send people, or, you know, I don't talk with people who are like going somewhere to, you know, get away from something or trying to find the ultimate right. place. Actually, I do. I talk to a lot of people who are looking for this ultimate place, right? This ultimate place doesn't really exist. I mean, there are some better places than others, right? Um, you'll hear right now hot and heavy talk about Puerto Rico. You know, it's definitely it's got one of the best mitigation spots in the world. You know, their tax laws and and uh, for individuals and and companies and uh, sole proprietors is fantastic, right? But it may not be for everyone. You know, and you may not want to live in Puerto Rico, right? So what you're looking for, what I tell people you're looking for is you're looking for a jurisdiction that doesn't tax you on your global income. Okay, so the U.S. does. Um, actually, believe it or not, Mexico does. Um, countries like Colombia has a wealth tax on it that people don't understand. So there are a lot of countries that you know do have territorial taxes. Some of those, you know, Belize, the Cayman Islands, um, a lot of the Caribbean islands. Typically, the smaller countries, the smaller islands um, that are looking to you know increase their growth or increase their population tend to have them. Um, a lot of the um, kind of uh, well, I would say the civil law countries like the Central American countries, they don't tax on worldwide income. So 
really when when I'm telling someone to look for number one, you know, you got to find a place that you like to live in, right? Yeah. So if you like the cold, you know, look north. If you like warm, look south. If you like, you know, laid back, look Caribbean. If you like, you know, frantic, you know, look at U.S. You know, but there are many many places that you can go that are that are that are beneficial to you. A lot of people don't understand that, you know. You can you can have great asset protection in the states. You know you just aren't a U.S. citizen. You get great protection in the states for for that. U.S. citizens are globally taxed. So yeah. um, I tell people you know check places out. Um, if you're always looking, you're looking at you know global tax, and then you're looking at residency, um, and then you're looking at whether or not you can live there. So um, you know take take a look out. But those are the three key things. Uh, what is their tax system? Um, how to, and what is their residency requirement, and um, can you live there? Being a, a U.S. citizen, um, how difficult is it to have a second passport, um, especially in the in the countries that you're looking for to to gain the benefits of their jurisdictions? That's a um, that's an interesting question. Um, from a U- U.S. citizen's perspective, um, I'm a U.S. citizen. Um, it it's really more about the foreign country than it is the U.S. country, uh, than it is the U.S., I'm sorry. The the U.S. is basically, it's, you know, um, if, if, if it's legal there, then it's legal for the U.S. So if, if, it, if it's legal in Mexico to have two passports, then the U.S. says, okay, it's legal here to have the passport in Mexico. If it's illegal there, it's illegal there. So typically it's not so much your country of um, jurisdiction, although some people are. Um, there are some countries that are very, very vehement about it, Singapore being one of them. Um, Singapore, you know, you get one passport, it's theirs. And so if you're a U.S. citizen, you want to become a member of you got to turn your passport in before you can get theirs. So, um, so two things to note on passports. One, in order to give up your citizenship, you have to have one. So you can't get a second citizenship without, you know, uh, you can't become an, an expat without having one. But really, it's more about the country you're going to than it is about the country you're coming from. So getting a passport is really about the requirements in the country you're headed to, uh, making sure you meet those. And typically, if you're a U.S. citizen, it's not a problem to have multiple passports. Um, it's not a problem to have multiple residencies, which is the step before passport, typically. It's also not a passport. But you know, there may be viewer, listeners out there who are from countries that only allow one passport. Um, it's also interesting, just on that topic, a little side note, there are countries that say you can only have one passport and then kind of ignore it. So I gave you Singapore, which is kind of like, you know, you can only have one and they walk you down and make sure that you turn in your your, your, your other one before they give you theirs, right? It, it, they're trading you for it. So you only have one. Um, countries like Panama, you know, believe it or not, Panama states that you can't have more than one passport, but that's a perfect example of a country that doesn't apply the rule because many people have dual passports from Panama. It's it's typically in those countries part of the Constitution, which is why that is, is a problematic, but they, they just kind of overlook it. Okay, that, that's some really great info. I think a lot of people in the states, they, they don't realize that having a second passport can be an option. I understand that you advocate having international bank accounts in some of these jurisdictions. What is the advantage of having international bank accounts and how difficult is it to open them? That's very interesting comment because um, a lot of times, you know, I think of international and I, I, I really think of it as not in my domestic jurisdiction, right? So as, as a U.S. person, um, we tend to think about, you know, I have my, you know, my bank account might be in the U.S., my uh, brokerage account is in the U.S., my crypto account might be in the U.S., my real estate mortgage is in the U.S., you know, so we get really centric and um, it's more about distributing that, like what what would happen if there was a systemic or economic or um, uh, natural disaster in that one jurisdiction I'm stuck now. I have no backup plan. I have no redundancy. It was like it's having like a, a single phone, like my phone drops in the water and I, I can't make a telephone call. Well, if my bank goes, you know, stops for whatever reason, I can't bank. Yeah. Having a second bank account in another country adds some redundancy. It adds some protection from distribution. You're distributing your assets off across jurisdictions. Um, I think it's interesting when I speak to people from um, – you know, European countries, they, they would spread that across jurisdictions. They might have their business in one country, their personal bank account, maybe in one country, maybe a second personal account in another country. 
um, maybe a corporate account, you know, so they've been through problems and issues and realized the, ability, the advantages of distributing things across wealth. A um, couple areas in the world that would really want a bank account in another place right now. If you're in Venezuela, you probably want a bank account somewhere else right now, but it's too late. If you're in South Africa, you want a bank account somewhere else, but it's too late. So unfortunately, I deal with a lot of people when it's too late. It's too late to... You know, the, the country's preventing them from moving money. In Venezuela right now, you can't move money. It's very difficult to move money in, very difficult to move money out. Had those people there had a bank account in another jurisdiction with maybe a debit card tied to it, they'd still be making payments. They'd still be able to live. So that's really it. It's about distributing risk, um, distributing your assets, you know, having redundancy in banking just like you would have it on, you know, on a computer system. Um giving yourself access to you know markets you may not and those are the the reasons and then there's the simple practical ones right i'm living in belize i need a local bank account right so those are the reasons really okay. and, and it is simple um, it, it depends on wh where you're talking about you know here um we we help people facilitate opening bank accounts throughout the world we look for jurisdictions that are private we look for jurisdictions that are easy um i i personally you know like Canada for U.S. citizens just to pop over the border and you can go over to Canada, open a bank account, you get access, you know, get exposure to a second currency, you get, you know, out of a, you know, a different financial system. So, you know, it's it's simpler than people think about. And it doesn't have to be, you know, an, an international bank account it doesn't have to be in Switzerland. You know, you may be living in Mexico and you need one in Mexico. You may be living, you know, in, in um, you know, uh, Nicaragua and you, and you need to use Nicaraguan banks. So there are many reasons to use international banks. For the favorable jurisdictions you, you mentioned, how protected are foreign depositors of these international banks from governments poking around in their account balances? <laughs> that's 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 the probably not, that's one of the biggest fears, right, is, you know, the people, you know, what, what kind of privacy is out there. So I, I'd say this to everyone, right? Um, you know, if the government, if any, if any government wants to get into your bank account anywhere in the world, they're going to do it. Um, you know, unfortunately, that's just, I believe, the world we live in. Um, so, you know, the reality of it is the governments are putting in place more of them. They want to know where assets are. They want to make sure that everyone's reporting it. They want to, you know, make sure that people aren't using them for illegal things. There, there are a lot of bad things that people do with money as well as good things, right? And, and that's really what it's about is, is the banks trying to understand who are they banking with and, uh, and what those individuals are doing with their money. Um, so um, you, you'll hear things like FATCA, you know, yeah. FATCA. Uh, that's the U.S. Um, attempt to get foreign banks to report that U.S. citizens have bank accounts abroad. Well, what's interesting about that is, is you always had to tell the U.S. government that you had a bank account abroad. Um, there was just no way for the U.S. government to check that you had a bank account abroad. So what they did is basically said, look, any banks that are going to deal with U.S. dollars need to become fat compliant um, or deal with U.S. citizens. You either need to tell us that you're going to you know, follow our rules and, and let us know if you have U.S. citizens there if we ever ask you um, or we're just going to tax the U.S. that it was new. We always had to tell them about it. What became new was the fact that now the foreign bank, if requested or you know at some point in time, has to tell the U.S. government that hey, yeah, these are the U.S. citizens that are holding accounts there. Um, if you think about it, and you've ever had a U.S. account, a bank account, at the end of the year, you get a 1099 INT, right? You get one, and the government gets one, and it tells them, hey, this is you know Patrick's bank account. This is how much he made in interest. You know, and you get it, the government gets it, they better match. Well, think of FATCA as the U.S.'s attempt to get the foreign banks to provide them that same 1099 INT at some point in the future. That's really what they're trying to do. On the other side, you got the OECD in Europe, and they're putting the common reporting standard in, and they're basically saying, hey, banks, if you want to deal with us and you want to be part of our organization, then you need to let us know if we ask you if someone has a bank account. So, uh, I, you know, that's what I see going on. How our, our jurisdiction? I think jurisdictions are going to be forced to participate. I really don't think they're going to have much choice. Um, they may put pressure on their consumers, um, but 
I think they're moving in that direction, and if not, you're going to get left out. And you're not going to be able to play, and if you don't get to play, able to play as a bank, it, you know, it, does, it, it kind of the game's over. But that's really what it is. It's not really as much as you know demanding it, as much as putting this framework in place. Um, and you know, they're not saying, "Hey, send us the report on every single citizen yet." Um, they're basically saying, "If we need to follow up or, or ask someone." Um, you need you need to comply and tell us who it is, and, and the banks are agreeing. Look at the bottom. A lot of it all actually came in the 2000 and um, some of the old um, terrorist laws in 2010 and 2011. If you look at a lot of the copyrights on a lot of the banks, they're basically telling you the same thing. If the government asks us, you know, based on terrorist activities, what's in a bank account, we're telling them. So, um, so that's the reality. The, the reality is. Um, are they searching and trying to find it out? No. Um, are they putting frameworks in place so they understand? Yes. Um, and I think that's the way the world's headed. Yeah, with um, <clears throat> banks, they're, they're they're pretty interesting. Um, there were there was a time I, I had called the bank, uh, asked them how much it is to open up an account. They they told me one thousand five hundred Singapore dollars. I go down to the bank and they find out I'm a U.S. citizen, and all of a sudden it's eight thousand to open up on a bank account. <laughs> So I think uh, they, in some ways they try to discourage U.S. citizens from opening up overseas. It, it, that that is a good point. There are some bank, international banks that just said, "Forget it." You know, we're not going to be fat compliant. We're not going to take U.S. citizens. All the U.S. citizens get out. Right? That was their choice, basically. And quite a few banks around the world did say that. They said, "You know, forget it. It's too much hassle. You know, it's not worth the risk." Um, you heard this term "de-risking." It was all the banks saying, "Look, we're just going to get rid of U.S. citizens. It's too much hassle to keep track. You know, keep track of it and pay for it." Then there are other banks who said, "You know what? We're going to we're going to keep them because their business was built around them, and we're going to charge some fees associated with it, and we're going to hope that that makes up the risk." But you're right; um, it'll be all over the board. From you know, we like U.S. clients to you know, no way, we're not taking U.S. clients. Um, but uh, but there are banks out there, and, and the fear shouldn't be around. I, I think it's an interesting question. I'll, I'll, the first I don't know if we're going to talk about it later, but it also is interesting for people who look at jurisdictions that are kind of both onshore, offshore, like Belize is an onshore, offshore jurisdiction, right? We have local banks, which would be onshore, that would be in Belize dollars, and then we have international banks that would be, or offshore banks that would be in U.S. dollars. So it's important for your listeners to understand that, and when you get into jurisdictions like Belize and and Guila and Cayman, you, you have two typical jurisdictions, you know, onshore and offshore. And I'm starting to even see those begin to dissipate, you know, um, where the offshore banks are becoming kind of more onshore, more requirements and more reporting into them. Um, but um, they're still out there and uh, you just got to look for them and um, we can help you find them. Yeah, we're going to need your help finding them, David. Um, <laughs> but uh, you, you, you touched a bit on um, gold, uh, precious metals. Are physical gold and silver assets that you would consider holding offshore as a way to diversify your wealth? Yeah, that's an interesting comment because a lot of people um, remember, you know, when gold was confiscated mm -hmm. or was, was, was pulled back when we went off the gold standard and they pulled things back and people, you know, didn't like that at all. And they still have lingering concerns about, you know, government overreach and maybe that happening again um, for people like that have people want to protect us then having you know i believe like many many people gold and silver are stores of wealth um they could also be an investment instrument but if you don't look at them like an investment instrument if you look at them as stores of wealth you, you'll note that they they hold the very well and then where where you know where are the stores of wealth typically been put they've been put in areas where you know, there's there's low risk or, or smaller risk of those countries being invaded and the gold being taken. So um, I think, do I think it's wise? Yes, I think it's wise to have, you know, some gold and silver within hands reach, some gold and silver within cars reach, and then some gold and silver within no one's reach, right? Um, so um, with that, um, uh, I believe that there, there, there are places then to store your gold and silver, looking for places like, you know, you guys have that capability, look for those companies that have that ability and, and, and use it. Same type of thing, right? Redundancy. Um, people always say to me, yeah, but Dave, my gold is, you know, if my gold's in Singapore and my gold's in Switzerland, you know, how do I get to it? And I said, do you remember Columbus? I, I think they figured out how to get to gold and silver hundreds and thousands of years ago. Um, yeah, it may be a little bit of a problem for us, but if, 
But if it gets to that case and that's what we're worried about, I'm pretty sure you'll be able to, to get your gold just like they did hundreds of years ago. Yeah, we'll, we'll make sure people get their gold back when, when they want it. Um, but I, I understand that... Uh, <laughs> I understand that U.S. residents are able to buy precious metals using their self-directed uh, IRAs. How easy is it to buy precious metals with a self-directed IRA and have the gold and silver stored offshore? Okay, that that's a very, very specific question, and we can take that in two parts. So there's two ways. Um, typically, there's, there's a couple of different ways that you can use a self-directed IRA. One is what I call direct investing from the custodian, right? So you go to a self-directed IRA custodian and you open your IRA just like you would anywhere else. And you then say, I want to purchase um, a condo. And the custodian says, okay, um, get me the paperwork. And he looks at it and he approves it and he makes the sale. And that condo is now in your IRA. Um, that, that direct investing out of an IRA for gold and silver, it can't happen um, that way. It can only happen that way if the actual custodian is a gold and silver holder, right? So that's kind of the tricky part of it. You can't hold gold and silver that way as easily as you can. You, you That's where you typically find a, a self-directed or an IRA custodian that says, you know, we hold gold and silver for you, right? They're specifically designed to do IRA custodial activities that are registered around gold and silver. So... The strategy that, that a lot of people use to do that is there's, it's called the self-directed IRA LLC. Now what we're doing is instead of buying it from the actual custodian, right, we're going to create a limited liability company. We're going to use our IRA to fund that company. So it's, it's owned by our IRA technically. But now that company is this third party. It's owned by the IRA. It's not us. We don't own it. So that entity can then go to the silver bullion and say, hey, Guys, I want to buy some gold and silver in the name of my LLC. Okay. Now it's a it's a legitimate transaction. That's that's the difference. That's how it's done. Um, and and now you know need all requirements, right? It's it's not it's you know it's held by a third party. You it's not in their possession because it's in an, in in the corporate entity and it's owned by their IRA. So that's the strategy to use if you want to own gold and silver abroad in your IRA and you don't want to do it through a "Quote unquote, only gold custodian." David, you're getting me excited. You're you're giving us a, a solution on how to do these things. That's that's pretty good. Um, but what it is that they're very, I, yeah, self-directed IRAs are very powerful. They, you know, they're powerful, and you have you have responsibilities that come with them. But they're very powerful structures. Yeah, I can see that now. Uh, but are there any restrictions uh, to the type of gold and silver that that can be bought? Very good point. Yes. Um, one of the things that people um, have to understand is when we're talking, there are rules in an IRA itself, there are rules. So when we talk about expanding these strategies, the rules around IRA still hold, right? So in a normal IRA, um, you can't put um, jewelry, you can't put artwork, you can't buy these things, you, your custodian can't buy them, you can't get them from Fidelity. Even if you call your you know, your self-directed custodian say, you know, I want to buy a piece of artwork. They'll say no. Th those are prohibited um, transactions. Those those things don't um, aren't allowed. So things like jewelry can't go in. You can't buy jewelry. You can't buy um, uh, uh, art. You can't buy cars. You can't buy these antiques. You can't buy these things that the government can't really figure out a common way to um value them right because it could be valued at a million dollars it could be valued at ten dollars depending on you know the art itself and who thinks it's good right, right. so that those are the things we got to stay alive and and so those rules that apply there also trickle their way down to the llc so back to gold well it says basically you know in ira regulations the only type of gold you can handle are 9.99999 so you have to have four nine gold you have to four nine you know 0.999 silver so as long as those those as long as your um, purchases that you're making at that that level and here at the IRA level, you're fine. So you want to make sure you're buying pure gold and silver as period point, point four nines. I think it's point nine 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 eight maybe or point nine 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 nine. That's required. Check. Don't quote me on it off the top of my head, but um, that's what you need to be able to hold in your IRA, whether it's through a gold custodian or through your own self-directed IRA LLC. We've been discussing the the benefits and 
issues uh, for individuals to go offshore. Uh, let's also talk about the business owners because there are special business structures available to them. Um, how would going offshore offer asset protection for business owners? Yeah, that's a great perspective. So a lot of people um, look at um, if you're in a litigious society or you have, uh, you know, so what do I, I see a lot of people who might sell, um, oh, what, it, oh, let me think of a, a, a recent one, uh, educational products, right? I have a gentleman who um, does educational products and these educational products might be on stocks and bonds and mutual funds. Well, in one jurisdiction, that might be considered financial advice, right? In another jurisdiction, that might not be considered financial advice. So that's a type of person who may want to get himself set up in a jurisdiction where he can provide that advice and it's not considered financial advice at all. There's one that's completely irrelevant, right? Has nothing to do with anything other than the interpretation of his local government on what he's doing, right? So yeah. there's an example of where internationalization can help a business owner. Um, online businesses, right? If you're if you're a you know if you're an online merchant person, right? That business activity is happening outside of your, you know, outside of wherever you are. So that's one of those where you may want to move and take it offshore. Um, you know, we talk about, we talk about U.S. persons specifically, um, there are advantages to partnering up with foreign persons when you start to go into international businesses. If, if a business isn't controlled, what we call a controlled foreign corporation or um, a, a, a controlled foreign corporation is one in which a U.S. person or U.S. persons own the majority, more than 50 percent of the company. And if that's the case, that company is treated like a U.S. person or like a U.S. company. It's taxed like a U.S. company. It has to report like a U.S. company. But what many people don't understand is you, if you have a foreign business partner and you are partnered together and there's not a majority ownership, well, now that business is not considered a U.S. business. It's considered an international business, and it has the ability to defer income, defer taxes, you know, defer reporting, things like that. So that's what people need to understand is there are benefits to when you're setting up internationally for people who are globally taxed to work with you know, partners who aren't globally taxed to get a corporate structure that benefits everyone. So, um, yeah, there are, there are businesses. Um, 2018, a lot, those, a lot of those benefits went away for the sole proprietor of the business. Um, a lot of those business, a lot of those benefits um, got rolled into, you know, pulling the money back through the U.S. through U.S. corporations. Um, so that's that's really the the takeaway is um, it really depends on what you're trying to do. But you know, I'll get rid of the number one fallacy, right? The number one fallacy in the world. And, and this always comes from the states is you know, all you do is set up an offshore corporation, don't put your name on it, run all the money through it, and you'll never have to pay taxes on it. That's a good way to wind up in a, an orange jumpsuit, right? That, that doesn't work. Um, if you're a U.S. person and you want to mitigate your taxes, you got to get your butt out of the U.S. or get yourself to Puerto Rico. That's about it. Um, or, or work through the, the tax changes and pull those offshore earnings up through U.S. corporations and, and mitigate them that way. But if you're not going to be outside of the country, um, your tax savings are going to be nominal. Um, so that, that's probably the number one thing that I would tell people is you know, don't don't listen to anyone who says just set up a foreign company. Don't have any in your name. Don't tell anyone about it. And you know, don't do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, you don't want to do it. And, and, and this age, I, I like to say we talk about the time, right? You can play hide and seek or show and tell. Hide and seek work back when no one could find you uh show and tell works far better these days <laughs> yeah absolutely I, I highly recommend showing okay how should business owners uh decide between setting up an offshore llc or an ibc so that's a good question um uh when we talk about asset protection offshore we're talking about a couple different structures at a high level there's, there's really kind of four containers it's the limited liability company it's an international business company. It's a trust or it's a foundation, okay? So easiest one first, foundation, typically what you think about, they're best for. You wanna set something up to give money away over time and have some um, uh, kind of vision into that company. You know, foundations work well for that. Trusts are the ultimate asset protection structure. If you're worried about someone taking your items or you're worried about generational wealth transfer, you're worried about getting sued, you know, trusts are that protection structure and we could, Talk forever on just those two but let's go back to the two basic offshore corporate structures limited liability company 
IBC. And this is how I kind of tell people to think about it. Limited liability companies should be used, are typically used for passive types of investments internationally. So real estate where your income is going to be coming from rental income, but, but it's a second job. Or um, you're going to own some agricultural products that are going to pay you, or you're going to own some stock that's going to pay dividends, or you're going to own you know, some, some income that you're really not working. It's really not a business. It's a holding, and therefore it's going to generate passive income. Those are typically best in an LLC. Why? Because the LLC's results are just going to flow right down through to you, just like a U.S. LLC, hardly any difference whatsoever, except for the form you reported on. But that's going to flow right down to the individual tax, tax form and you're going to pay income on it just like you would if you got interest in a bank account or on a capital gain. IBCs are different though. IBCs typically will want those when we're running businesses or ordinary income. So bed and breakfasts, online marketing, management, sales, you know, anything like that, anything we're going to have employees, we're going to pay bills or we're going to mm. operate. That's when we want to have an IBC. So that, that's kind of the depression to me. So at the simplest point, you know, I work, a sec, uh, uh, I have a primary um, occupation, but I want to buy some condos, um, you know, in a secondary market. I would use an LLC, an international LLC to hold those assets. And I would do it for a simple reason, right? Someone trying to sue me to get at those international assets have to go take on that company internationally. The other way around, if something was to happen in one of my limited, you know, one of the condos that was owned by my international company, it would prevent someone from easily coming back and suing me in the United States, right? I, I want that two-way blocker. So limited liability company. Now, now if I'm, you know, setting up a sales and marketing company, you know, I know I'm, you know, I'm setting up a business. Now I want an IBC because I might have employees, I might have deferred expenses, I might have, you know, um, uh, deferred taxes in it. So those are the two um, two structures that I tell people. Um, and for anyone who's you know looking at the foreign earned income or anything like that, that all has to be ordinary income. So that's all IBC related. Um, LLCs are really for self-directed IRAs, pass, take passive income, um, LLCs, active income IBCs. Okay. How about uh, controlled foreign corporations? Could you tell us a little bit about those? Yeah, so I touched on it briefly before. A controlled foreign corporation is one, and this happens, you know, once again, it's, it's kind of U.S., it's a U.S.-centric kind of term, but it, it applies elsewhere. Um, it really is the United States saying to its citizens, hey, if you own a company and you're the 100% owner of that company, we're considering that you, right? It's your company, you're a U.S. person, so we're going to tax it like a U.S. company. Um, when they and so that's what a controlled foreign corporation. If I have ten partners and we're all from the U.S., even though we only own ten percent of it, it's one hundred percent U.S. owned. It's going to be treated like a U.S. controlled foreign corporation. That's simply the matter. But if I have a partner, let's say you and I, Patrick, we decided that we wanted you know our podcast was successful and we wanted to do more and we wanted to join together. You know, if you're not a U.S. citizen, but I am a U.S. citizen and we own a company together 50-50, well, guess what? It's not a U.S. company anymore, right? So now we ha now we get some benefits of, you know, maybe we don't have to pay taxes on the income as it comes in. You don't have to because you know, you're not, you know, you don't have the U.S. tax burden. You know, you look at what Singapore tells you. I look at what U.S. tells me. And, and now because it's not controlled, um, we could maybe hold that revenue. We may want to reinvest it in the company. I would have to pay when the company paid me or the company gave me a distribution. The company paid me a salary. I would pay on that, but I wouldn't be paying on the revenue that came into the company. And that's the big difference between a CFC and a non-CFC. Uh, but for yourself, given that you live outside uh, the U.S., do you know of any legal, legal tax exemptions that U.S. expats should be aware of? Sure. Uh, and then, in fact, that's all we deal in, you know, kind of the, the legal way to do it. But yeah, the the big one, you know, outside kind of Puerto Rico kind of trumps all right now. Yeah. But the big the, the one that still exists is the foreign earned income exclusion, the FEIE. It's for individuals who um, are going to work abroad, whether they're going to work abroad um, on, a, on, a, on, a, on an objective test, like 330 out of 365 days. That's the simple one. If, if that happens then they get this foreign earned income exclusion. 
for other people who are moving to live and work abroad and setting up and you know maybe there's a bona fide residence test but basically what you're going to look at there you know don't, the numbers are about a hundred thousand dollars of income that can be tax free when you live abroad and about 20 grand of living expenses plus or minus a little bit at all you know how you know how they make things all calculations based on this or that or the other thing and you need you know a computer system and a CPA to put them together but in general you're going to be looking at about you know 100 grand of tax free income um, when you live abroad um, and depending on how you might how you structure it you may not you know you may not have to pay social security taxes you may not have to pay state taxes things like that so um, and that could be for you know the you know a, a husband, a spouse, a, a what you know a, an individual um, a, a, a spouse who's setting up their own company or a, a couple that may be working together, a man or woman, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, and and then and family members. So there are ways that that's really it. The foreign income exclusion is really the last bastion of tax savings for U.S. citizens living abroad. Okay, uh, David. Can you let our listeners know more about uh, your work and Georgetown Trust? Sure. So I I've, I've, um, represent Georgetown Trust. It's a trust company out of Belize. It's been uh, in existence for over 18 years. Uh, they help um, individuals who are looking to uh, create trust structures or corporate structures and hold assets outside the United States. They help facilitate uh, obtaining licenses, bank accounts, um, a variety of offshore services. Um, I personally, as you help, I, I, um, you can get to us at concierge at georgetowntrust.com. Um, I help individuals, um, you know, talk with them about uh, what it is they're trying to attempt or what it is they're trying to accomplish internationally or what they're looking to do. Are they simply looking to live for a few months, a year somewhere? Are they looking to set up, you know, and live? Uh, permanently? Are they looking to live and work? Are they looking to work, work remotely? All of those things, I, I will consult with them and, and help figure out a plan of action for them. Okay, sounds great. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Do you have a, a Twitter as well where they can follow you? I don't actually, believe it or not. I don't have a Twitter account. Um, but if they come to our website, we do have, um, we know, I do blogs um, uh, probably a, more, uh, not as frequently as you guys do or I should, but um, typically, the best thing is reach out to us at concierge at georgetowntrust.com and um, have a have a consultation with me. I'm, I'm more than willing to you know talk with people about you know their personal situations and see if we can help. Okay, so if I have a 401k and and I, I knowing that most of it is in paper assets, uh, mutual funds, stocks, bonds, and if I don't exactly trust what's going on and I am considering maybe I should roll some of it over into a self-directed IRA, I should be getting in touch with you. Absolutely. You know, if, 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 if you are looking for, you know, IRAs, um, remember that they have to be non-active. They're either rolled over ones that you've created, um, or you're, you know, looking at, you know, opening up, simply open a bank account somewhere outside of your home jurisdiction, or you're looking to, you know, do an online business. Um, any of those would be reasons to get in touch with me, um, and see if there's a way that we can help you. Okay. So it's not as hard as people think. David German from Georgetown Trust, we thank you for spending time with us. It's been a pleasure speaking with you, and you've given some really, really great info, and we're definitely going to be putting links to your webpage. Patrick, the pleasure was the pleasure was all mine. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'd love to chat again at some point, and I look forward to seeing you guys uh, in the near future. Thanks again, David. Take care. That was Dave Drummond, Vice President of Sales and Marketing of Georgetown Trust. More of his writings on going international and offshore asset protection, please visit his website, www.georgetowntrust.com. If you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to the SBTV channel to be updated on new content. And do also check out the SBTV podcast on iTunes and Spotify.